Everybody had a nice break and a happy new year. Yeah. Well, sure. Christmas and New Year's are on like the weekend, the Friday, Saturday, but the break is just completely. Yeah. You kind of get to look at New Year's, but good Wednesday. Good Christmas Day on Wednesday. New Year's Day. <laughs> That's when we get the night for all the break. Right. <laughs> Well, it's seven o'clock, so we're going to start the meeting. Uh, this meeting is being held in, in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act. It is open to the media and public. Notices were duly posted, and the meeting was advertised in the Hunter and County Democrat and Courier News. Formal action may be taken. There are two open public comment sections on the agenda. The first, which follows the superintendent's report. Is only for questions or statements pertaining to items on the agenda. Should you have any other questions or statements, these must wait till the second and final open public session at the end of the meeting. These sessions are for the sole purpose of the community to express their comments in the public forum, and the superintendent and board is under no obligation to respond during the meeting. Can everyone stand for a salute? So tonight is our annual reorganization meeting. Uh, we elect uh, have new board members being sworn in. So section three is the reorganization election results. I'd like to congratulate uh, Mr. Peach, Mrs. Wolf, and Dr. Cerciello for their election, as well as Mrs. Fetterman. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. Um, now the section is to do the oath of office. So I need all four of you to stand, and you are going to repeat after me. Raise your right hand. I state your name. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New Jersey, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and to the governments established in the United States. And this state under the authority of the people. I state your name. Do solemnly swear that I possess the qualifications prescribed by law for the office of member of a board of education. And that I am not disqualified as a voter pursuant to statute, nor disqualified due to conviction of a crime or offense listed in statute, and that I will faithfully, impartially, and justly. Perform all the duties of that office according to the best of my abilities. 
So the next section is to do roll call. So I will go around and uh, state if you are here and present. Mrs. Betterman. Present. Dr. Sociello. Here. Mrs. Fiore. Here. Mrs. Ample. Here. Mr. Peach. Here. Mrs. Pogorski. Here. Here. Mr. Wallace. Here. Mrs. Wolf. There's one vacancy on the board. The next section is to elect a president. Uh, can I get a motion and second to open this section of the agenda? So move that. Second, Carol. Do I have a nomination for president? I'd like to nominate Carol Campbell. Second. <laughs> Is there any other nomination that can be made? Not seeing any at this time, I'm going to do a roll call. You would vote yes, no, or abstain. This is Betterman? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Cerciello? Yes. <clears throat> this is Fiore? Yes. This is Sample? Yes. Mr. Peach? Yes. Mrs. Pogorski? Yes. Mr. Wallace? Yes. Yes. Mrs. Wolf? Yes. Congratulations, Carol. Congratulations. Um, if you want, you can assume or you can just read from uh, your current chair. Um, you are going to take over the meeting because you are the president. And the next section of the agenda would be to call for vice president nominations. Do you want me to move? It's completely up to you. You don't have to. I'll move next time. That's perfectly fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I start now? You are, yep. Okay. Um, can I get a, we're moving to the section of election of vice president. Um, Can I get a nomination of a vice president? I would like to nominate Dr. Sociello for vice president. There will be no second meeting. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? <laughs> I'll get better. I'm sorry. Not hearing any other nominations. Can I get a roll call? Motion and second. Motion to elect Dr. Cerciello for vice president. Do we have a motion? So move that. Do we have a second? Sorry. Can we get a roll call? This is Betterman. Yes. Dr. Sociello. Uh, yes. This is Fiore. Yes. This is Sample. Yes. Mr. Peach. Yes. This is Bogorski. Yes. Yes. Mr. Wallace. Yes. Yes. This is Wolf. Yes. Passes. Congratulations. Thank you. Great. We can clap for Cleo. Okay, so I just realized that my paper is cut off. Because that might be why I'm in bad shape. Do you want to copy the paper copy? I have it, I have it up, up online. So, uh, all right. So, moving on to reorganization, can I get a motion to adopt R1 through R5? So, move that. Second, Camille. Um, are there any questions? I will um, comment that uh, hopefully tonight, maybe first thing tomorrow morning, you will get an email from me that will um, 
ask you to let me know which uh, committees and um, associations you would be interested in representing. So the associations you represent as a member of the Board of Education, um, we have a, the delegate and an alternate. Um, and then in the committees that you're interested in, and then Camille and I, as Vice President, will um, sort out, get everybody into the committees, and we're gonna try to do that as soon as possible because there are committee meetings coming up in the next few days. Um, are there any questions uh, regarding R1 through R5? Not hearing any, can I get a roll call? Mrs. Bedwin? Yes. Dr. Sociello? Yes. Mrs. Fiore? Yes. Mrs. Sample? Yes. Mr. Peach? Absolutely. Mrs. Bogorski? Yes. Yes. Mr. Wallace? Yes. Mrs. Yes. Wolf? Yes. Passes. And we have a superintendent's report? Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Sample, when we published the agenda um, back in December before break, uh, the COVID situation is not what it is now. So we have two presentations tonight, one of which was not on the agenda. That's the COVID update, as well as our board attorney Roberts here to do the uh, code of ethics update. Do we have a preference of which one goes first? Do, uh, do, do we want to? I, I would think the COVID first. COVID first. And I, but don't worry, I prepped Robert to make it go second. So he's, he's, ready, he's ready to sit and he's waiting in the wing. So we can do one. <laughs> do you, Robert? <laughs> you really? um, Larry, if you could bring up my presentation for this evening so I can update the board on the uh, current COVID situation. Yeah. Happy New Year and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our reorganization board meeting. It is fairly traditional that we don't put um, presentations or agenda items on this Board of Education agenda because it's the first uh, Board of Ed meeting after the new year where new board members are seated and we reorganize the board. Uh, however, the COVID situation has really changed, transitioned, developed over the course of winter break. Um, and as schools have reopened after winter break, I thought it would be warranted to at least update the board and the public as to some of the conversations that have happened uh, over break as well as over the course of the past uh, two days with schools being open. So uh, here are some updates for you as we move into the new year. Uh, tonight's presentation, we'll talk about the positive case and attendance statistics, the COVID activity report, um, which has changed as of December 25th, safety measures that are in place and other safety measures in place as we watch that COVID activity report. Some things that are to come that have been published by the Department of Health, Test and State Protocols, as well as the new CDC guidelines and whether or not they apply to schools or when they can apply to schools as well as hybrid instruction. So the first thing I want to start with just briefly is our, our guiding principle that we, we talked about back in August, and it's really to prioritize in-person full-time instruction to the extent possible. We were hoping as much as possible for this year as we entered, entered our second year of, of COVID, really our third school year that was impacted by COVID, um, for as minimal disruption to students' instructional schedules as possible. We would do this while, while adhering to the CDC guidelines, the Department of Health protocols, as well as the requirements that we have for the public health situation to ensure that our students remain safe. Our guidance, guiding principle still remains, right? We want schools open and we want kids in schools, and I wanna make that clear. I, I firmly believe that children learn best when they're here in school, and we want them in school as much as possible, but we also have to follow the guidelines that we've been given by executive order and by Department of Health. So our goal is to, as much as possible, uh, keep kids in school to the extent we can do this. This presentation outlines some of the measures that we're, we're going to take. So first, let me just give you some statistics. Um, if you're watching the dashboard, um, we'll talk about that in a moment. But student attendance, I had our tech department run student attendance over the past couple of days. This gives you the numbers of how many students who are virtual, right? These are students that are quarantined uh, because of some kind of close contact or COVID positive and learning from home because they've recovered, as well as students that are just absent for one reason or another. It could be due to illness. It could be because parents have decided not to send children back to school immediately. But for one reason or another, we have student absences. We also have virtual students. Um, so we see that, that things have changed a little bit 
um, between yesterday and today. We had a lot more student absences yesterday. Today, absences went down. Um, but we do see that when it comes to virtual students, we have 127 students that are designated as attending or learning virtually, which is a lot of students district-wide. Um, and broken down by building, you see how many students we have who are learning virtually as well as students who are absent for whatever reason, other illness, illness in general. Um, yeah. Excuse me, can we share the screen um, with the people that are home? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. We, uh, Larry, are you able to do that? Share your screen or share the uh, computer screen here? Our apologies to folks at home. Um, so this and the next slide, are, are we? I think we're good, right? We're sharing with folks at home. Uh, along with our positive cases, cases dashboard, the left-hand side shows how many students district-wide since the beginning of the year uh, and staff members uh, have, are COVID positive. And then the right-hand chart is January alone, right? And we know that January and December were two months of the highest numbers of positive cases over the course of uh, this particular school year. I want to make note when it comes to virtual learning and absences, we're not done counting yet. The nurses are still, our school nurses and school staff are still catching up on the emails and the phone calls from winter break. And we are still identifying either positive cases that we know of, and we're also working on contact tracing anyone, uh, even as, as uh, soon as yesterday. So we're, we're not done counting. The nurses have not done their full contact tracing and identified students. Uh, who should be in school and students who shouldn't be in school yet. So we're still working on that as well. I, I don't know about you. I knew that the holidays were going to present a challenge for us in terms of COVID. Um, but maybe mistakenly, using last year as a barometer of how December and January went, January wasn't terrible last year, right? Like it seemed like we came back from break. There was, there was a little tiny spike in cases, but by, by and large, January is when we made plans to reopen more fully in February. Um, this amount of positive cases and quarantine is not necessarily expected. Um, like everything else, I suppose, with the evolution of, of the COVID virus. So let's talk a little bit about monitoring another metric, which is in-school transmission. I've been asked a lot of questions about this via email, and I, I crafted a response that I sent to the board, and the response has been gone out to um, parents who've inquired about this. <clears throat> this is a difficult question to answer. Um, so this is the official state of New Jersey dashboard that's published, and you can find this online that talks about statewide anything school-related as far as within school transmission or in-school outbreaks. So using this information and knowing that, and I'll, I'll just point out here that um, new outbreaks, here's cumulative school outbreaks, um, here are cases related to those outbreaks, and then here's Hunterdon County that has seven, when I checked today, outbreaks, as well as I think this is 51 linked cases to outbreaks. So the reason why this is hard to answer is because we can suspect, right, that if we identify a child as COVID positive, and we identify, let's say, a list of 10 kids, that are close contacts of that child, and one or two of those children become positive within 14 days, we can suspect that potentially there's some sort of transmission that may have happened in school. But there are so many factors that we just simply don't know. If we suspect in-school transmission, what happens is we send all of our information over to the Department of Health. The Department of Health opens up, and based off of what I learned last year, opens up a case investigation to determine whether or not this is within school transmission, and they do a further investigation from their vantage point. 
interviewing parents, talking about information, symptom onset date, positive case date, you know, some other information. They, they draw some conclusions potentially, maybe sometimes it's inconclusive, and they give us further information. So we provide everything to the Department of Health. We are running under this assumption or the operation that the Department of Health will make a determination about in-school outbreaks. And, and the reason we think that is because the state is actually tracking it by county of how much in-school transmission there is, as well as how many outbreaks there are in school. That doesn't mean that we don't su suspect things, right? We have a tracking sheet, a district level tracking sheet that all of the nurses and all the principals and I'm on. And within that tracking sheet, I went through and revisited this with the nurses. And this is what we came up with over the course of the past month. We're aware of about four cases that are suspected of in-school transmission. There were three cases at RMS. And when I say within school transmission, it's we have a positive case. And then on our spreadsheet, we have, let's say, Carol Pample, I'm going to use you as an example. Carol's the positive case. And then there's a list of students that might be close contacts that were quarantined because of Carol Pample as the positive case. If I'm one of them, and within 14 days, I turn up positive. I'm then marked as potentially one of those three cases at RMS that might be within school transmission. We send that information to the Department of Health for them to open up an investigation. Now, these four cases that, I, that I'm referencing here, the three at RMS and then the one in preschool at Three Bridges, are cases that we've suspected. We've done our investigation, but we have that hasn't been picked up by the Department of Health in terms of doing an outbreak investigation. So we suspect. Can we conclude or confirm? I, I don't know. So th these are the cases that we watched and watched very carefully to see if we had any suspected in-school transmission. The good news is, is out of the dashboard, right, the hundred and some odd positive cases of students that we've seen, to have four suspected cases that we sent over to the Department of Health is pretty good, right? You know, by and large, our mitigation measures in school are working. The masks, the distancing, it, it's working the best we can. So the COVID activity report, a second piece of the update, it's changed. <clears throat> this is the report as of December 25th. Uh, what you'll notice that in this report is our region remains orange. Much of the northern part and north uh, eastern part of the state um, has turned red, indicating a very high COVID activity level, level based off of the metrics. In our conversations with the Department of Health over the winter break, we suspect that our region will turn red this Thursday. Uh, so that's likely to happen. <clears throat> Knowing that, let's just review some safety measures, some of the current safety measures, um, and what will change as the report changes. And I'll just review these really quickly. Um, let me go back to one thing, because you might be curious about this. Uh, my apologies, I skipped this part. The three cases at RMS, let me talk about the within school transmission just to be more specific. And this, this continues to change based off of our investigations because these are fairly recent. These are all around um, winter break. Case one at RMS, one student was identified positive based off of one close, one close contact out of all of the close contacts became positive within 14 days. Case two at RMS, three to four students became positive after the close contact. Case three at RMS, we had two suspected students that became positive after the close contact. And Three Bridges Preschool, we had three to four other students who became close contacts after the close, who became positive after the close contact. I just did want to mention that. So, you know, we could estimate that we would send over to the Department of Health, hey, we're concerned about these four cases. Here are how many cases we had that resulted in some, we believe, some kind of incident transmission for their investigation purposes. I just wanted to mention that. My apologies. <laughs> Safety measures. Um, Really briefly, these are all of the safety measures that we still maintain in schools at a very high level. Distancing, three foot distance between student desks. We have barriers in high traffic areas and in offices that are smaller. There are a lot of areas, Jason, that even still have HEPA filters in certain offices and certain classrooms uh, for air quality. Our teachers are vigilant about hand hygiene for students, particularly during snack time or breakfast time. Um, Daily rounds of cleaning, our electrostatic sprayers are being used. We have increased outdoor airflow, windows are open. We have hand sanitizer um, and soap available in all of our classrooms. Like I said, we're, we're likely going to go red as far as high activity come uh, Thursday. If our re region turns red, the leadership team, we talked about some uh, additional safety measures in order to prioritize in-person instruction. 
Our plan is to suspend after school sports, clubs, field trips, facility use, and in person visitors. We're going to be transitioning some of our meetings that were otherwise in person to virtual. Um, the purpose in all of this, if we go back to our guiding principle, things like sports, clubs, and field trips are just areas where if close contact happens, we're likely quarantining more students. With already 127 district wide positive cases, 100 and some odd students who are out on quarantine or are COVID positive. If we want to preserve in person instruction, we think for some time, maybe a couple of weeks, that if we suspend these activities, it allows us to focus on in person instruction for longer. Um, some other things to come. Uh, we received uh, initial guidance on how to do test and stay. Going back to our guiding principle, if we want more students to stay in school, the Department of Health is offering us a way to allow students to stay in school using a test and stay protocol. Some states are piloting this or have implemented this across the country. This allows for us to combine our contact tracing efforts, right? So we identify students who are close contacts within school of a positive case, as opposed to sending those students out and quarantining them for whatever period of time, eight days, 10 days, 14 days, We'd allow them to remain in school and every other day test um, for COVID. We, we currently do this for um, staff members who are not vaccinated through a company called Miramis. They're our vendor that allows us to do this. So this is under investigation right now to see if this is even possible, only for those students who would be within school with close contacts. This would be a course parent choice. We would need authorization or consent to have to test your children if you want to keep them in school. Otherwise, your choice would be for your child to have the you know, eight day quarantine, 10 day quarantine or 14 day quarantine, maybe five days, we'll get there. Um, we'd have to identify close contacts still. We would have to do um, the testing for the eight day or excuse me, the 10 day period anyway. So it would be every other day for 10 days and we would be obtaining parental consent. So this is something that uh, Mrs. Beagle, our pupil services director and I are looking into. Uh, and we're looking at trying to schedule a conference call with Miramis to see if this is something that would even be possible. Um, the new CDC guidelines, over winter break, the CDC released guidelines that said, <clears throat> that basically the summary is reducing the quarantine uh, period for close contacts to five days an isolation period for positive cases to five days. Again, this is good news to keep kids in school, right? It reduces the quarantine time timeframes and the positive case isolation period. But, and, and it also adjusted the fully uh, vaccinated definition. So this is again, a good thing. So we received this guidance, uh, school superintendents got excited that we would be able to keep more kids in school because they would be quarantined or isolated for a shorter period of time, right? That's the good news. Um, the bad news part of this uh, is that after we got the news from the CDC, we thought the Department of Health would identify it and adopt this for school settings. They have not yet. The Department of Health has told us to continue using the 10 day quarantine period and the 10 day isolation period for positive cases until such time that they come up with school specific protocols. So all of the schools in our region and the state are still using the 10 day um, periods until we get the update. I don't know if or when we'll get that. I know that the superintendents in this county have a conference call scheduled with the Department of Health on Thursday of this week. So those are a couple of things to come. The impact would be hopefully more kids in school for in-person learning, right? Hybrid instruction, cameras on. Uh, so what does this mean? So as we continue to go through uh, and we identify all of our positive cases and students who are in isolation for 10 days and all of our 10 day quarantine students because they're close contact. Uh, we see that number grow of how many students are not learning in person and the number of students who are learning virtually is getting larger and larger and larger. Putting a lot of strain and pressure on our tutoring program and our virtual uh, homework help programs that we are offering currently. So there are three cases in which we're going to start turning cameras on in classrooms. If children are identified as a close contact in school and they're quarantined, if they're at close contact elsewhere, even outside of school and they're quarantined, we have to, you have to let us know so that we know that the camera needs to be on for your child. Like let's say they you know, are a close contact because of a dance recital or something like that. Or if the child is COVID positive, has recovered well enough uh, to attend school virtually. A 10 day isolation period is a, is a long time, right? Some kids bounce back in 24 to 48 hours. Some kids may need the full 10 days. 
But if kids are well enough to attend school virtually, we want them to attend school virtually if they've recovered from COVID. I believe sick kids, right, children that are ill should be ill, right? They should be having chicken soup. They should be watching the prices right, right? Those sort of things kids should be doing at home if they're ill. So please, if you have a child that's ill, think about the old school days, keep them home, let them rest on the couch for a little while, have some chicken soup, watch the prices right, and rest and relax for a couple of days. There shouldn't be any pressure to attend school virtually. We want, we want healthy kids to come back to school, and we don't want them to feel the pressure to have to attend school virtually if they're ill. Um, K-5 teachers will have their cameras on for all core academic periods in grades six through eight. They'll have cameras on for all of their academic periods, eight periods a day, because one period is lunch. Um, this is going to start on Thursday because, like I said, we're still counting the students. We're still trying to identify all students that are out for one reason or another, quarantine, isolation, COVID positive, something like that. We're still working on that. So in order to know which students are eligible to be able to identify the, the students that can come in and go to school virtually, we, we're still counting them, we're still identifying them. Um, and this is also temporary. Again, going back to our goal of keeping in-person learning our priority, this is temporary. We know that this has surged. We know that the surge will hopefully quickly come back down. And we're hoping that we can reinstate our tutoring sessions and we can focus back on the in-person learning in the next couple of weeks. So we're hopeful by the end of January that, that teachers can begin closing their cameras and closing their computers and focus on in-person instruction, which has been our priority since the beginning. All of the information in my presentation, any feedback I get from the Board of Education or the public tonight will be addressed in a letter to the community tomorrow just to, to give these updates, some similar updates, some similar information um, that's been presented tonight um, and any feedback or thoughts that you have. So I'll take the questions from the Board of Ed, if you have any questions. I have a question, Dr. Hart. Yeah, sure. Uh, I know we've talked about this before, but I'm just looking at your three instances of someone who would qualify for hybrid yeah. learning. Um, my, my question or concern has to deal with kids who are symptomatic, so they're home yeah. and they're awaiting test results. And so, you know, they're sick maybe for the first day or two, but then another few days beyond that waiting on test results, would they be eligible to log in for hybrid mind? That's a good point. That's something that uh, I'll have to address with the administrators. Because testing, from what I understand, is taking a lot longer. Uh, that's my right, like so that's we had a yeah, very like, COVID Christmas in yeah, our house. Yeah, and it was, I get it. Yeah. It was five days to get our hands on a test and another five to actually get the results. So yeah. you could potentially be waiting a long time to get the test results to get back into school. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. something to think about or, or Thanks, I think, let me make a note of that. And again, back to sort of the point about, you know, if you're if you're ill, right, you want to be you want to be home and you want to be resting, right? I don't want students to feel the pressure to have to log in or anything like classes. But should there be a point where they're better and they're anxious to log in and see teachers? Yeah. Okay. But let's let me add that to my list. Thank you. And then for the test to say, my second question is sure. um, with the vendor. So how quick of a I mean, I know that's something you're exploring, but is that something that can come online fairly quickly or there's a, in truth, I haven't, there's a document that the Department of Health sent us that I haven't gone through the full document, and there's there's some things attached to it that are concerning that are sort of logistical and operational hurdles, like a licensed nurse has to be doing the collection, or the vendor has to do the collection themselves, they have to set up some kind of site, there's periods for which they have to do the testing, like I said, every other day. Um, uh, and we could, by the way, to use our ESSER ARP money, our federal grant money, in order to achieve that as well. Now, Miramis, we're already doing it <clears throat> right now through the state grant money. So we're able to, if, if they can do it for us, then that'd be great. That'd be great, right? We can hopefully be able to do that. Um, it, it's going to take a little bit of time. I, I, I don't know if I could put a finger on like weeks or like a week or something like that, but it's, we're, we're looking into it. And are they are they antigen tests or PCR or what is it what is this test for you? That's the other. I think um, Miramis is doing anti antigen right now, I believe. But I, I I have to go back through the paperwork. But I think there's a specific type of test that needs to be done. Okay. 
Um, don't quote me on that though, but I know that that's also one of the other hurdles that we have to get through the DRMs to be able to offer it. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Martin? Yeah. yeah. I, I appreciate you making the distinction between the five day quarantine and the, and the 10 day quarantine. Yeah. Of course, I would imagine most people want to minimize the amount of quarantine days. Uh, my understanding is that because we're now, once we get to the red zone, is when we have to start that, the, the 10 day quarantine. But uh, as long as we're in the orange zone, I didn't realize that as soon as Thursday, we'd likely be in the red zone. But could we anticipate once we go back to the orange zone, we'd go back to a five day quarantine? Is that Kind of the guideline would be I think that that's what would happen. I, I think that that when we when we start moving backwards from red to orange to then yellow, right, and then hopefully to green at some point soon, I think that we're going to start to see a significant reduction in the types of restrictions that we would imagine, mm -hmm. uh, particularly after the surge in cases over the course of time. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and I, I think it's anticipated for Thursday to be red and very high. It may not, but I'd say. So then that would be the time that people which should expect it to then go to a 10 day quarantine. Well, it, it is 10 days right now. We can't do the five days yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the CDC put out five, and this is where the confusion came in for the general public. That's the language they're using. For the right. general public, the quarantine and isolation period is five days. Okay. In fact, I think there's even confusion too among doctors' offices and pediatricians because I think they're telling poor parents, you know, your child's only out of school for five days because they've adopted the new CDC guidelines. And that's what, the, what our nurses are hearing, is that the doctors are telling um, parents, which is adding to the confusion, but the Department of Health has made it very clear to us that we can't adopt the five-day guideline until they give us school-specific um, guidance and information. Right. Um, and that's for the general public. So right now, it should be five days, right, for going to shop right or whatever else you're going to do. But in school, we're still applying so, 10 days. 10 days. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else from the table? Okay. Question. Questions from the audience. Uh, so, so do, is the board okay if we open it up to the public now for uh, public comment specific to this? Are we okay? Strawful, non-official? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Unless, unless you all want to stay for a board ethics presentation too, you can. You're welcome to stay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So, yeah. um, can you come to the podium and yeah. so that people can hear you on the microphone that are home? So, hi, my name is Andrew from Texas. And, you know, um, earlier today, I appreciate your patience. Yeah. I have a couple, couple of questions regarding the testing in schools. One is, will the technology for that be released to the general public? So I think you said Miramis. Miramis yeah, is so the Mir platform? Yeah, Miramis is the, they're the vendor. That okay, they're the vendor. So they're the vendor. It's not, I, and they have all of their technology um, and the types of tests they use on their website. So before we would offer this to uh, students, because we would need parental consent, parents mm -hmm. would have to go onto the website, read all the information. Um, that Miramis has published and sign a consent that's also online as well. So I will publish all of that to you so that you can see exactly what kind of technology is being used and gather as much information from them as possible. Great. Um, and also, you know, when we think about the recent cases, right, when we, we all know that there's been the mass cases. So yeah. like, I, I don't know how much of the population got COVID over the Christmas break, but it's a sizable amount, right? One would think that we're at least walking towards some sort of herd immunity here, right? Um, and knowing that so many people have had COVID, have had the vaccine, even fallen to the criteria that, although it's modified, still is considered immune. Um, how will we account for people who have had COVID and our contact trace, and within three months may still come up as pop? It's a great question. Um, so, and I want to, uh, let me make this clear, if, if I understand your, correct, mm -hmm. your question correctly. Let's say a child is, a child had contracted COVID within the past 90 days. Within those 90 days that they contracted and recovered from COVID, they're identified as a close contact. They are, for the purposes of contact tracing, considered immune, at least for those 90 days, and would not have to quarantine for that 90 days. Mm -hmm. Beyond the 90 days, there's a likelihood that perhaps they can contract COVID again or they become a close contact again. Once the 90 days expires, they now, that child is now considered no longer, for the 
I'm going to use air quotes here, right, for our purposes, immune, if you will, or uh, protected, so they would then have to go back into quarantine. Okay, so from a parent's perspective, right, what kind of documentation do you need from us, right? If we have the family gets COVID over Christmas break, we've got a bunch of little tests, right, uh -huh. that we all did at home because they sold them at Wegmans. What do we need? Do you have that test? Do you, do you have the, did you hold on to anything like that? That's what we asked for. We asked for proof of recovery from COVID. So would a picture su suffice if it's time stamped? Or, so. you know, because I have luck. I, I'm not keen on taking my kids for antibody testing. I don't think many people are. It would be like the blood draw, right? Um, you know, what, we're just curious as to what kind of documentation do we need to keep our kids in school and to say this is natural immunity. Right. Because it factors in here. Yeah. Frankly, I mean, the CDC said it, right? Yeah, it does. Hold on, to, hold on to those pictures, and I'll get back to you on all of that as well, because I do recognize it over winter break. I understand it. I think a lot of folks who lived it, Beth, you may have lived it too, right? You couldn't get you couldn't get an, an official test, right? Go to a physician or a testing site to get the documentation that maybe you need. So maybe you did an at home test, maybe that came back positive kind of thing. If you could find an at home test, right? Like some people couldn't find it. You can't even find it, right? right? Like anybody else, right? Right. So it's it's a challenge. So just hold on to that and I'll get back to your question. Okay. And we'll, yeah, because I have some I have some friends curious about that, right? Um <coughs> Um, test to stay. Yeah, I know this is not your problem, but I, but I have to say, because I think it's going to be our problem eventually, right? Because everything has become right power problem. Right? And, and that's, <laughs> I think that's why you're probably seeing an uptick in the board meetings, right? Because parents are starting to get concerned. We're paying attention, right? Um, you know, the definition of unvaccinated. I saw it on the CDC guidelines. The six. Six months mm -hmm. with two mRNA. Yeah. Who knows how many boosters you need now? Uh, J and J is two months, and you're considered that's considered immunity. Um, to me, this blurs the lines of vaccinated to un, or immune to un, un, not immune, right? This brings the vaccinated to unvaccinated argument. Um, I have parents that are concerned, and that's why we're starting to come to these meetings that with the new emergency authorization of children being allowed to get vaccinated, that the schools are gonna start pushing for that. I'd like to know from this board's perspective what the push may look like from Reddington for our school children on an emergency use authorized vaccine. I think Carol, you to answer kind of what I, what I know. I'll tell you what I know. Sure. Thank you. Um, already, there, there are some statutory hurdles that I think should it be. I guess what you're asking is, do you think that a vaccine, a COVID vaccine, would become a requirement for students to attend school here in Reddington? Is that, is that the question? That's one of them, yeah. Okay. There, there, are, there are some, in order, to, in order to make, so there are a lot of vaccines that are requirements. They're already existing, and Robert, there are statutes that allow for medical and or religious exemptions from, from mandating vaccines. So while there are already mandatory vaccines, there are exemptions already. Um, I can't predict the future. I don't know what the requirements will be for a COVID vaccine in the future here, but what I suspect, and this is me just guessing from my perspective, is that the state legislature and or the governor is going to have a hard time navigating around those statutory exemptions that already exist for vaccines. Mm -hmm. That's just my perspective. Okay. And it's interesting from my perspective because I'm pro-vaccine, right? I, 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 I'm supportive of a vaccine. Um, this one's a little bit more challenging because it's our children and there's no, no long-term safety data. Essentially, our children are the test cases. Um, and I just think that taking a lawyer here, right? Yeah, he's here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a liability that, if enforced, is take, to me goes on, on the liability of the schools. Understood. Um, and I, I think that there are several parents who feel the same way. And just a couple of us came and, and are online to represent that position. 
that until there is long-term safety data on the vaccine and it's still emergency use authorization, that we feel that it's not a safe option or a risk-based approach for our children. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that's one position. The other one is is something that we have not talked about as a society. I mean, nobody's talking about the fact that herd immunity exists and natural immunity is often better from an uh, immune response perspective, and there's tons of data on this. Um, you have a greater breadth of response if you actually have COVID via natural infection, and people are not addressing it. So I ask the board to consider that moving forward that children who have had the COVID in infection naturally are also um, uh, bucketed into that group of immune individuals. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? I just want to hear it. Um, hi, I'm Laura Talty. I have three kids in the school district, middle school, Hollywood care, and three bridges. Um, a couple of my questions are, I may have missed this as you were giving your sure. presentation, I apologize. Um, if the child is ill, like you're just saying, randomly ill, you know, a parent decides in their best interest, it's their best interest to keep them home. Sure. Um, and then there's no fever, there's no other symptoms, and the parent just wants to send them back a day or two later. What is your protocol on just sending them back and not having to have, go out and get COVID testing and things of that sort? You'll have to go into, um, we have it on our safe return plan. There are, there's, there's like two categories of symptoms. There's like, if you, it's, it's like if you have two symptoms that are here in this category, you're considered symptomatic for COVID. Or if you have one, you're not necessarily right. Like it, you have to go through the list. So it's kind of like if you have one symptom from here or two symptoms from this category, this is when we consider you to be potentially COVID positive or presumptive positive or something along those lines. If you contact your school nurse for that, uh -huh. questions regarding that, she will advise you of exactly what to do based off of the symptoms that your child presents with, whether it's just like a quick 24-hour fever, fever that resolved itself. Um, I think that might be from category one, I'm not sure, um, versus a cough, right? That's in category two. Based off of those symptomology, that's when we determine whether or not further testing is warranted. Right, because yeah, I think that was a little, it's, that gets a little confusing with how the symptoms are constantly being added and taken off. Yeah. I don't also think that the nurses in all these three buildings are also always saying the same stuff. Okay. And that's, you know, problematic for, you know, when you have three kids and you're mm -hmm. trying to, you know, keep as many in school as possible. Right. Right. Because mm -hmm. yeah. they're not always all sitting at the same time. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask you, out of all these cases that have been investigated in the school and through the health department for these children that have tested positive for COVID, how many of them have had serious illnesses from it, as in hospitalizations? How many of these kids have been in the hospital seriously, seriously ill, more than just what we would have called the flu in 2019? I don't know. I don't know. Would you say, would you dare to say not many? I mean... I would dare to say probably not many, yeah. but... I, yeah, I, we haven't tracked hospitalizations from COVID <laughs> cases here in school, so. That might be something to consider just to, you know, yeah. going forward with going, you know, with putting that in the state's hands to show them that this is really not something that should be scaring us and our kids out of school. Um, taking that information, how are you guys hand, taking mental health into consideration? Um, for these kids that are basically being over quarantined and by contact tracing and in the event, you know, that you're going to go virtual or have a hybrid learning system. You know, like you said, and I, you know, agree with you and I believe in you as my kids, you know, we moved from North Jersey here to come here basically for the school district. And, you know, like you said, you want to keep these kids in school. It is important. That's where they need to be. This is part of their development, their learning, where they, you know, the rite of passage, it's, it's all of that. I'm sure you have, you know, sitting with children. I do. So how is the mental health aspect being taken into consideration because keeping them out is really affecting their mental health. I see it in my three children, I speak with family and friends, and it's affecting them, right? Yeah. Can so, I, yeah. Um, can I, I have a sixth grader who came into sixth grade with, uh, you know, maybe the education of a fifth grader because he's not a virtual student. 
and he was out from March and Oliver in fourth grade and didn't go back to Reddington until six. That's a huge a year and a half. There's also some information coming in. I work for a prevention education service company along with this woman here, Justina. There's information we were discussing today on the Zoom that these children are not ready for high school, right? Eighth grade are getting ready to go to, to Central. They're coming in as freshmen and sophomores with a seventh and eighth grade mentality. And they're talking about it being attributed to COVID and, and the learning system that's going on. So it's just, I'm nervous, you know, I'm, and I just, you know, I need them to be in school. Yeah. So thank um, you. You're very welcome. I'll, I'll, I'll give you two, maybe three things really quickly just to talk about their health. Um, we've talked a lot on our education technology committee about our social emotional learning curriculum. And we have Mr. Tumula, who's a supervisor of that program. Um, and we just adopted at our last board meeting, maybe our November board meeting, a district wide tier one SEL um, curriculum scope and sequence. In addition, we're piloting, we piloted uh, last month, and we are piloting uh, in this winter uh, a special mental health curriculum. Uh, for students in grades, we're piloting an eight, five, and two or three, a particular mental health curriculum that we've researched and our school counselors have identified for mental health um, for adoption and into the curriculum in the next um, curriculum cycle. Um, and the third and final thing is we've used our SRARP money to partner with the Hunter and Medical Center, and we have a school-based youth counselor over at RMS who's here three days a week who are seeing an additional third tier of, of students that require additional intervention beyond SEL, beyond a school counselor. They're actually a behavioral health counselor, school-based behavioral health counselor from the medical center that's over at RMS. Um, so I hear you, I, I get yeah. it, I, you know. Um, I just think it's, you know, it just really needs to be taken into consideration that them out of school and over testing them and over you know and, and you know where they're almost these kids are almost afraid to talk about if they don't feel well yeah you know just they just need to just get back i mean we all you know part of growing up is getting a little sick in school watching the prices right right like that's what i grew up with you know, exactly. chicken soup, and, and, you, know yeah. you talk about oh my god you know you can't you sick you have the flu or whatever yeah this one didn't get it which is like COVID. some kids yeah. get it some kids don't my three kids we had it, one of them didn't get it. She was with her brothers and sister, brother and sister the whole time. So, yeah. you know, it's, I know it's a funny thing, I know it's a touchy thing, I know everybody doesn't agree on it. You know, I, do, I would not want to be in your position because I, that's it's not an easy position to be in your hand and all different parents and different views, but I think everybody agrees that, you know, education is huge. We, you know, this is a state with a good education system and we should be, these kids should be in school, mm -hmm. so. Thank you. You're very welcome. And, and I really do think that that's where we would all agree, right? This presentation, the Board of Education, parents that are here tonight, parents that are online tonight, right? Our guiding principle is kids in school, right? In person learning. Um, I think that there's no disagreement about that. I just have one question. Um, the students that are vaccinated, excuse me, will they be tested? Is that your state your name for the society generation? Um, are the students that are vaccinated, will they be required to test too if they come in close contact with somebody? I have to give that some thought because students are so students that are vaccinated. Here's why. Students that are vaccinated and are considered close to fully vaccinated and considered close contact do not have any restrictions. In other words, they don't have to quarantine because they are fully vaccinated. We, we can debate the merits of this, sure. but it keeps kids in school. Right, like again, back to our guiding principle: if you're vaccinated and you're close contact, you get you're you're staying in school because you don't have any restrictions. Um, whether or not we would offer testing to them is something that we could discuss. I'm curious because I know two of the RMS kids; mm -hmm. they were vaccinated and they have COVID. So I'm just curious as to why if they were in school, vaccinated, spreading it, but they don't have to be tested even though they had COVID. They will currently had COVID. Right. So, I yeah. Just wondering why, you know, it sort of comes into a factor of discriminating against one or the other. Mm -hmm. I, I understand. I, that's the, those are the, the public health protocols that we were okay. that we were given, and and you know, it's a protocol that allows students to stay in school. 
right? And so back to our guiding principles. Maybe there should just be some data. I would like to know, like, of the kids right. that, you know, how many of those students were vaccinated that also contracted it. Yeah, understood. Just because that seems to be a pretty big deal. No, thank you. Justine or Ryan, the question if there was any data on the students that are contact traced based on exposure to somebody that had COVID, how many of those actually tested positive for COVID? And the reason that I ask that is because my sixth grader was contact traced twice. Neither of those times did she test positive for COVID, but she potentially could have missed 20 days of school. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious if we have any numbers on that. I do. I've provided those numbers in the presentation. So there's four cases that we know of, four positive cases, that then we saw one, two, three, or four students test positive based off the suspected close contact. But how many out of all the, out of all the students that have had to quarantine based on contact tracing? So if you have if you have one positive, you have one positive case, right. and say you had ten students that had to quarantine. Yeah. How many of those ten students now tested positive? Yeah. And then you had another student that tested positive. Like we've had out of all the cases that we had, say in December. Yeah. You know, I would love to see the numbers on that. Yeah, I'm saying the numbers four, right? So we have four positive cases. Case one at RMS, we had one student test positive. Case two at RMS, we had two to three, they were quarantined, right? So we had one positive okay. case, we quarantined 10 kids, one came back positive. I, I'm making that 10 number up. Okay. Case number two, we quarantined, let's say 15 kids, three came back positive. Case three, we quarantined, again, I'm making up the middle number, right? 20 okay. kids, three came back positive. Three bridges, we quarantined, or we had one positive case, four came back positive. So let's think about those numbers. I mean, look at the amount of school days that these kids are missing. That, that to me just doesn't make sense. Like my, my daughter could have potentially missed 20 days. Luckily that second time that she had to quarantine led into Christmas break. Yeah. She's in middle school. If she missed another 10, she missed a half a day the one time. She was so upset. She was trying to get online, figuring out what school work. She was in tears. She completely stressed out about it. Like I, I just, it doesn't make sense to me to be contact tracing these kids and having them sit home for 10 days, they, they're being sent home with zero symptoms mm -hmm. and then are, ne are negative and they don't even have COVID. So I think that's something that we really have to look at and we really have to consider with all this contact tracing. So I'm, I'm, that's one thing that I'm just asking you to really look at and consider going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I got a cough again. Um, going back to the number that we just chatted about, and thank you for, because we were chatting about this this week, right? Um, and I thank you for pulling together those numbers. I feel like, I, I look at data, right? I look at a lot of data. These numbers are biased because they also came at a time where there was COVID cases throughout families, throughout, and we talked about this. It's the very true, There's yeah. so many variables that this data, to me, is maybe more so hyperinflated because so many families came down with COVID over the Christmas break prior to after Thanksgiving. Um, you know, so I think we have to take, even though, we, you know, the numbers are small, we have to take it with a grain of salt just due to the high numbers of the general population. Um, so that's my comment on the data. It would be good to track that in the future. Um, if we do decide to continue quarantining, I think it's a fair question from the parents. If my child is quarantined, how many people come back positive? That's just a data point that I feel that it should be tracked operationally. I know it's a nightmare to do so, but um, it, it's worth doing. Agreed. Um, the other things, my child's been quarantined and he's horrible at it, which is why my child is now two years behind in his academic development to, to read a uh, fifth grader, reads at the level of a second grader. So, um, and with that said, while the kids were home, when the schools were closed, closed down, we had a tutor at a hundred bucks a day. 
to help supplement them. But they're still so far behind. My kids are social kids. They like to be learning with their peers. And, and I will say, I'm so impressed with Red Reddington schools and how they teach kids to interact socially and solve problems. Um, my concern is not only for the kids, but what about the teachers? Because um, I could imagine that it's a tremendous strain on the teachers to be able to manage both a virtual environment and an in-person environment. I do it in my pharmaceutical company, and it's a hot mess. Um, so I really feel for teachers who are not managing business professionals. They're managing children. who My kids hang from the chandelier during quarantine. Okay? So, you know, I just want to know what additional support are we considering for teachers who are teaching hybrid in the next couple of months? Because I would hate to lose some of those really fantastic teachers that do such a great job with our kids. We're supporting the teachers as much as possible. I mean, they've been prepared for this. Uh, I know that they've had faculty meetings about it um, since the fall, right, in preparation that hybrid or virtual could be coming at any moment. Um, I know today the principals were sending out messages, giving them faculty meeting time, preparing to prepare their lessons and make sure that they were ready for hybrid or remote um, at any given moment, even, even as much as today. Uh, so we, I understand that we feel for them. We've offered them a ton of professional development since March of 2020 on all of the different platforms uh, that we have here to help support them in virtual instruction. Um, you know, the best thing that we can do um, is give the teachers our tools and, and we've done we've done that we've given them tools um, one of the things that we also did with our ARP money ARP money recognizing that teachers are people too right and they need support as well as we uh, purchased a employee assistance program for teachers and their families should they at any time need to you know visit the medical center or something like that for any type of employee assistance so that's great I feel like teachers should have that as an norm maybe not just in this type of scenario. Um, it's interesting you say that, you know, the schools have prepared the teachers for this. Our experience has been when our kids are quarantined that they get about an hour of instruction a day. Um, that has been insufficient for children who are social learners, who do interact. Um, that's actually been detrimental during the quarantine period, my children. I, um, I'm fortunate we've had somebody to come in and sit with our kids the entire day when they're quarantined, um, just to help supplement that. But not everybody is as fortunate to do so. So, um, you know, when we're thinking about moving forward with additional quarantine, that they, for the board to consider that. Thank you. I believe um, if there's anybody else in the room, we have comment that um, Bradford again has his hand raised. I think we're him first. Yes, thank, yes. You, thank you very much. Um, I hope I'm not getting an echo. Um, I was curious in terms of uh, you know protections and, and safety considerations regarding administrative staff versus uh, teachers. Uh, understanding that uh, teachers in these school districts often uh have a a different category of of benefits compared to administrative staff um just curious you know in in the case of exposure or risk uh especially with you know little ones at home uh what type of uh considerations are being offered to the administrative staff the administrative staff or the teaching staff the administrative staff and considerations meaning like the ability to work from home, flexibility. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, for example, um, you know, using uh, vacation days versus sick days or time off or, you know, whatever needs to happen in order for an administrative staff employee to fulfill their, their quarantine duties where it exceeds their allocated sick time. So that, I mean, that's something that's really handled individually on a case-by-case -case basis between the administrator and myself. Um, you know, the, the administrator's contract has 
at least, Jason, help me out, 12 sick days, 22 vacation days, four family illness days, three personal days. Family um, illness. And um, bereavement. But if there's an extraordinary situation, you know, I think that the relationship between the administrators, myself and Mr. Bone, is one of collaborative in nature where we have discussions about the needs of the staff member and we can handle, you know, their needs on a case by case basis. Okay, understood. I, I, I think I would end this with, uh, I, I would urge the board to consider some sort of standardized accommodation across staff that doesn't necessarily meet or, or isn't allowed the, the same accommodations as someone with a, a teacher's tenure would receive. Thank you. Uh, can you read the comments? Sure thing. Um, we had a comment from Colleen Clark. The road board Reddington Ready Plan that has been available on the district website proposed early dismissal and cohorts for red. What has changed? I mean, I think that our priority of in-person instruction um, maintains our focus and maintains our priority. I also think that red the data for red is simply different with this particular variant. Um, and I think that those two things combined have us not yet looking at hybrid or early dismissal days um, till we need to. What do you mean early dismissal? She, she mentioned early dismissal or cohorts. Cohort. Co said? Cohorts are like A, B days like we did last year. Okay, so yeah. you said hybrid, you were- they, Yeah, they, I'm sorry, I meant okay. cohorts, yeah. My apologies, yeah. Okay, we had a question from RC Gamer. Do you plan to return clubs and sports sooner than later? Our kids have already missed so much. Yes, I do. Um, there's the question from Brad Rankin, which I think he asked in person about the administrative staff. Okay. Um, question from Lisa McDonald. Very glad, or I guess comment maybe. Uh, very glad for the return of synchronous learning. Wish it had been available from this Monday. Yeah, we, we just didn't know who. Yeah, right. Right. We, we were so counting we're cases on Monday. Yeah, we're still counting. Okay, um, from RC Gamer, if the home tests are acceptable, then all school nurses need to be aware because not all of them are on the same page about them being accepted. There's, there's a, there's confusion about that, right? They're, they're accepted when there's no from our school doctor. I could get this wrong. I don't know if I want to say it because I think I might get it wrong, but I think when there's no symptoms, when there's no symptoms and a, and a child is testing out of quarantine at that day seven, we'll accept the at-home tests. But if there is, or if there are COVID symptoms present and a child doesn't at home test, we want the PCR test. I think that's the, that's the discussion that the nurses have had with our school doctor. But I do recognize, and I talked with the nurses about this today, that we maybe need to meet again to make sure that they're all on the same page. Because there is there, there are times when the at-home tests are accepted and there are times where they are not. And, I, and the big difference that we discussed today, or at least one nurse I talked to today was symptomology was the difference. Yeah, actually, right now you can't get a PCR test if you've got a positive home test. So that's what physicians are saying. If you already have a positive home test, they're not willing to retest and also, um, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, you can't even get an appointment. Um, so when we're talking about pulling a kid out who's, you know, has a stomach ache, yeah, and they need a negative test, you're still going to be out five to seven days. It's a problem. I mean, also consider the financial for some parents that are now needing to go pay full pace to their doctor every time they have the test. An office visit. There's, there's a lot of things to consider here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I, I think you know the test to stay option. My ears are open to it. Um, I, I would love to not have to take the kids to a testing center that's filled with people with COVID every time. Right. right. So if we could do it someplace within the district, to me, as long as it's not something we're doing weekly to our kids, at, you know. I am more for that. 
Um, follow up, I guess, similar, uh, Laura Volvo had mentioned also um, making sure that nurses are on the same page and having clarity and consistency about PCR versus the at home antigen test. Um, Brad Rankin, what is the process to speak? Oh, sorry. Yeah, we didn't speak Brad. Sorry, just reading my order here. Um, Joy Costigan, our Reddington teachers are simply incredible. We are so grateful for their tireless efforts. Yes, round of applause for that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And the nurses too, I have to and the administrators. Uh, they they have been fantastic, all of them. I, I think beyond that too, also yeah, I would yeah. say I would the bus drivers, right? The, everyone. We, we opened yesterday, folks, right? Like we, yes. we were here. We we had staff. It was great. Custodial staff, everything. Yeah. Um, okay, Laura Vogel, agree with the above. We have been blown away by support from the teachers. Almost 45 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time during their lunch breaks and prep time. Just incredible. And then RC Gamer, when do we get back to treating basic things like stomach aches, non-COVID related? And then Jessica Lestuk, no question, just want to thank the Reddington educators, Board of Ed, and Dr. Hart for always having the best interests of the students and staff at the heart of decisions being made. There are no easy tasks and no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to COVID. Thank you for all you do. And then I do believe there was a hand raised. Um, Carmine, is that right? I might have unraised the hand. I think there was a comment. Another one? Okay. There's a, a comment above Jessica's and then one below hers now. I have above Jessica, I just have RC Gamer when we get back to treating. I already read that one. Is there another no, one? No, there were two comments from RC Gamer. I don't have that one. I don't have that. Do you want to read it? <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> uh, RC Gamer, when do we get back to treating basic things like stomach aches, non COVID related? I did read that. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> um, and then a comment just came across from Lindsay Salah. Thank you for everything, the, board, the Reddington admin, teachers, and staff for taking care of our little ones. Uh, are there any other comments? Can I say one more thing? Uh, the other thing that I just want to is when kids are quarantined, when they're pulled out of class, they're literally sat in a hallway, six feet apart, and not even told why they're out there. And I just think that that's kind of cool. Because our kids all got pulled out, and there was like eight kids all like lined up, like they were criminals. And they had no idea what happened. They had no idea why they're out there. But they all can talk to each other, and they all figured out that the one kid that was missing in school was their friend who was, you know, homesick. But like, they don't even, like the school nurse, and she doesn't even tell them. Like, I think by the time you're in fifth grade, you should be pretty honest with the kids and kind of let them know, have an open conversation with them. Let them know why they're being born, like why they're being pulled out of class. You know, like my son was like in the middle of taking a science test and they just kind of came out and he said, Brody, get all your stuff together, you have to leave right now. And like they just kind of like shuffle them to a chair. Like it's you know, embarrassing. It's embarrassing to them. And then they're all sitting out there and the other friends are walking by and they're like, oh my God, what happened? Is that? I mean, can't we find a more dignified way right, of pulling kids out of school? Yeah, it's kind of like there. I can add to that. So this was in this situation where my son was the one who was totally positive, and it was it was heartbreaking for me to hear that his friends were treated that way. Yeah. Because it's you're putting that child that's COVID positive in this light of shame when you do that, because there's nothing wrong with testing positive for COVID. Three, three years ago, you got the flu, you asked your buddy if he was better, and that was it. Did you get better? Like, I don't know what the guidelines are, but why there's such I don't, I don't have a medical taboo where you can't say this, yeah. you can't say that. That needs to just end because everybody's going to get it. It's like just getting a, a sick or whatever the case is. I'm not talking about cases where people have morbidities and things like that. I know there's serious cases. I'm not taking that away from anybody. You know, I, I know that there is. But when it comes to these children and they're standing in line lined up out there, and, and then the mother comes in, in and, and they don't want it. And they and they end up watching it. Well, and then they and then when they yeah. find out it's their friend that had COVID, it's no big deal. It's taking that, but it's, it's just sticking them in a hallway, yeah, in a chair where everybody's just kind of looking at them, like what happened? Because you know, I mean, 
right, and then you're still putting that customs of shame on those kids that get it then, so then they right. feel, you know, they, they're feeling this guilt now already, again, which goes back to the mental health, health thing of like, oh, what am I taking my friend out of now? That he can't participate right. in this and can't participate in that because he gets blown way out of proportion. Mm -hmm. And these kids don't get sick in some cases. No. A lot of cases. All better than 99% probably. Yeah. And all of them, like, when, yeah, none of them got it. Right. Yeah. And then we had to fight. Then, with the incidents of the lunchroom, Mr. Nigro was out there with a the tape measure, actually measuring how far apart these kids truly were. And then it turned out that two of them were able to come back to school. Mr. Nigro thankfully called me on Halloween morning on Sunday to tell me that he was in here going through his emails. And he actually was able to take out a tape measure and realize that my son Brody was just six feet from where her son was sitting. And all of a sudden now, he already missed a Falcon football game. He already missed a flag football game. He was almost going to miss Halloween. He missed his Halloween parade. For like in two inches, I mean, that's a little ridiculous. I mean, it's actually, it's ridiculous. So I just, you know, like I said, Mr. Nigro was at least able to come back to school on my day, but I mean, pay measures on a Sunday morning. And how many of those? Over two inches. inches. Over I two mean, inches. It's like for a fifth grader who plays Falcon football, has to miss a game, miss his last fire game. I mean, you Halloween parade, but he never even had Halloween parade here in Hong Kong because he didn't have it last year because of COVID. So it's like, how much more are we going to take away? Like inches? We're going to take a big sports on Thursday. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's it's not. We're just concerned about preserving the mental health of our kids right now. We have kids that are all clothes that are athletes. Yeah. And keeping them together has been really important for us. We thank God our the kids are all in the hallway together, right? Yeah. Um, because they're a pretty strong group of kids, but it's it's the kids that don't have that community around them. You know, you're, you're teaching them to point fingers at yeah, them. Yeah, that's why I said too. I feel like it's the judgment. I mean, they're, they don't, they're not judging each other. They just, they got sick or they, whatever, they didn't feel well. But it's like, the way it's being handled seems like a big, you know, pointing finger situation of just, you know. But then I'm so curious, back to my contact tracing, I'm curious how many of those boys, how many of those yeah. students are yeah. out there. Exactly. My sign at the time. In June, for the kids, it was five months. He, I have antibodies now. He had antibodies higher than if he was vaccinated, and he was so close from school. And I was on the phone. They school. They missed school. Everything. And then to get a phone call on Halloween morning from Mr. Nairo that he was two inches closer when he measured. I mean, <laughs> I think the contact tracing really needs to be considered. considered. Yeah. Ridiculous. Well, it, it, it needs to be reevaluated and yeah. it can't come down to inches. It has to be correct. It does. Do we have a we have a hand raised on the online form. Brad Rankin. Hi, yeah, me again. Um just wanted to chime in uh with uh, a bit of appreciation. Um and uh mm -hmm. you know, express some gratitude in, in terms of the, the placation of you know how uh, a lot of these these comments are handled and and addressed. Um, I think, as educators, we're probably all on the same page that you know a lot of this does start with education and not isolation. Uh, you know, explaining the the circumstances uh, regarding you know why a child might be escorted out of a room or uh, you know uh, separated from their peers. Um, including the the context and the safety mechanisms that you know can ultimately um you know re-include them or or help their 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 overall safety and understand the the impacts that uh e exposure can have to peers and uh loved ones so um just wanted to express some gratitude there and and really just voice the opinion that you know education doesn't stop in the classroom it's it's something that continues at home, uh, whether it be you know reading stories, playing games, doing exercises, whatever uh, you know whatever comes to mind that fits the, the personal family lifestyle. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately, just wanted to take an opportunity to express a little bit of gratitude here. So thank you all for for doing what you do.
Dr. Hart, Tom Wallace, if I could speak real quick. Um, there was a lot of questions uh, today regarding quarantine times, five days, 10 days, 14 days. Uh, if you could just touch real quick on who sets that stuff. That's not set by the board, that's not set by the district. Um, and what would happen if we didn't follow those guidelines that we're, we're pretty much told to follow? I think a lot of people really need to hear um, where this is coming from. Yeah, so we've been fortunate enough to have a Department of Health that's just had open communication with us and they provide guidance to schools. Uh, like I mentioned with the um, lost it for a second, the test and stay and even the quarantine guidelines, the five day rule, um, they haven't yet provided the updated guidelines to schools, but they do have very school, school and childcare and higher education institution guidelines. And we get our five day, 10 day, 14 day quarantine guidelines from um, the Department of Health. That being said, the guidelines are also dictated by the color of the acti of the matrix, right, of the uh, code activity report, red, orange, yellow, green. So depending on what, uh, you know, color we're in may dictate how we handle quarantine guidelines. <clears throat> the other thing that I will mention too is when there is confusion or um, advocacy that the quarantine guidelines have to change. The Huntington County superintendents have been very open with contacting the governor and the legislature about some of the, these hard questions. We are hearing our communities and we've written recently, uh, just before break, about why we are in this situation. And part of the reason why, I don't know if, if the board remembers, when we went to Orange, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, we moved to the 14-day quarantine guidelines. Part of the reason that got dropped back down to 10 was because of school superintendent advocacy to the Department of Health that said this is too long. Kids can't be out of school for this long. So that moved down to 10 with the ability to test out after seven, which is good. So this kind of advocacy is really, you know, these are good things. So it's it's good that we continue our communication with our partners at the Department of Health, but these guidelines come from that. I do have just one last question, I promise. Please keep in mind you have to come to the podium. Wait, I'm going to have to say goodbye. I'm sorry. Thank you. Right. Thank you. No, yeah. Thank you. Have a good night. So I, understand, I do understand that you don't set the guidelines right. on quarantine, but who sets the guidelines on the contract on the contact tracing? Where does that come down from? What, what do you mean? Like who says, oh, you know, they're within six feet for 15 minutes, or they were riding the bus together? Like where where do those rules come from? That comes from the Department of Health as well. So the contact tracing is six feet distance, mask off three foot distance mask on 15 minutes or longer under over a 24 hour period. Okay, I'm sorry. So it's six feet six mask feet off. off. Yep, for 15 minutes or longer. Three feet mask on 15, well, okay. yeah, within three feet mask on. Wait, did I, did I miss? Three, three feet with masks on Correct. for 15 minutes or more. If you're within so that would be like a bus ride. That would be a bus ride. You'd yes. be, right? If you sat next to a child on the bus, even with your mask on, you're still with close contact. Okay. So that information can be found on the New Jersey Department of Health? Yeah, okay. all of this can be found on our website as well, too, okay. um, under the COVID information page. But yeah, that's where those guidelines come from. When it comes to the investigation, that's the nurse and the principal and the teachers all collaborate to decide who is within how many feet of whom, mm -hmm. right? Like, and. and I get it. I get the frustration. It's imperfect. I mean, we're talking about 1,500 kids moving about four buildings all day. I, I, we're doing the best we possibly can with this deciding who's three feet and, and six feet. Yeah. It's, it's frustrating. It's imperfect. It really is. You know, I mean, we, we do the best we can. Um, it's just especially when you find out that most, I, I would probably guess that most of those cases turn out to be negative. You're right. I mean, there's no question. I told you about the four cases, right? Yeah. You know, like, we, there's no question. Yeah. Uh, if there are no other public comments, can we continue with the superintendent's report? Yes. We pride you, Robert, for school board ethics presentation. Um, we're all just standing on the legs, right? Anybody who's interested. So, um, each year annually, when we reorganize the board, it's mandatory that we provide our new board members with um, a school district, a, an ethics presentation. The School Ethics Commission and the Code of Ethics that I think the oath that you took and the ethics that you'll sign 
um, are going to be presented to you by um, Robert Lorfink, our board attorney um, from Fogarty and Harris Knight. Uh, these are, uh, if you will, sort of your do's and don'ts of um, board membership, right? The, the kind of rules that govern us as a board and how we operate and decisions being made and things like that. So let's turn it over to Robert. Um, Larry, will the clicker work with his PowerPoint yes. presentation if I provide it to him? Yes, it will. We'll find out. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. So, right, good evening, everyone. Um, as Dr. Hart just said, my name is Robert Lorfink. I'm an attorney at Forty and Harris, and our firm has had the privilege of representing the board for many years now. And I guess, you know, thank you for having me here tonight to, to discuss what I'm sure is all of your favorite topics. And for the new board members, I'm sorry that we're calling COVID with an attorney telling you what not to do. So, yeah. hopefully, okay. it gets better from here. Uh, so, tonight, I'm just going to talk about you know, governance, the role of the board member, with you know, a focus on the different laws that apply to board members, with an emphasis on the code of ethics and you know, the conflict of interest portion of the school ethics act. So, you know, I think the main, the main topics, the main takeaways that I want to leave you with tonight is, you know, the unique role that you have here on the board of Ed, and the way that that unique role is really shaped by the ethical limitations that are imposed on you by the state. So this is an office that is very different from any other elected office in the state of New Jersey. You know, frankly. You know, when you get elected, generally you get to make laws, but board event members don't get that opportunity. Instead, as we'll talk about, you get to oversee the operations of the school district here to ensure that the school is well run. So almost in a sense, you're more of a board of directors for a corporation than you are a typical elected official like a congressman or the state legislature member, you know, whether you're the senator or somebody. So and there's going to be some strict ethical limits that apply to all public officials. You, know, you have to avoid conflicts of interest, whether or not you're on the board of ed or the governing body of the municipality or in the state legislature. So then that's going to be everywhere. But when you're on the board of ed here, you also have this code of ethics that Dr. Art was just talking about, which is going to require you to do some things like support and protect school personnel. You have to provide accurate information to the public. You're going to be making your decisions in terms of the educational welfare of children. And you're not allowed to, uh, to uh, surrender your independent judgment. These are all unique aspects of service on a board of ed that other elected officials just frankly don't have. I mean, you don't think your congressman is thinking about these things in quite the same way. So, why do you think here? Ultimately, I'm here to keep you all out of trouble. You know, we don't want to uh, see any litigation arising because of something that you may have done. The public is watching you closer than it has in many years. And ultimately, nobody wants their name on an opinion of the School Ethics Commission. So I'm going to start diving in with the role of the board. The board's general powers and duties are set in Title 18A of the New Jersey statutes. The board of ed here is creation of the state, which essentially means the state gets to decide what you do and what you don't do. So the board has no independent right to exist. You know, boards of ed are not mentioned in the New Jersey Constitution at all. So the Constitution gave the legislature a directive to provide for a system of thorough and efficient schools. And what it did was create boards of education. So they can tell you what to do. And there's ultimately not a whole lot that you can do. And as you see here, the NJSA 18A 11-1 is really kind of the source of so much of what the authority is for the school district and it's pretty clear that the board of ed has to enforce the rules of the state board of education you have the power to make amend and appeal rules for your own governance but you also have to do all of these things consistent with the law it has to be consistent with the rules of the state board of education so unfortunately whether we like it or not we're kind of stuck with what Trenton tells us 
Now, the starting point for our authority is that we have to follow what is given to us by the legislature and by the state's board of education. So, what are some things that the board does? Um, uh, it's not like you have no authority whatsoever. Can you have two things like you're approving curriculum? I mean, we have to comply with the New Jersey Student Learning Standards, but ultimately the board is going to decide how it's going to meet those standards. We have to adopt the budget that's going to provide us our own efficient education annually. We have to work with the superintendent to hire the appropriate certified staff to educate our students. And you have broad discretion to develop policies. But I think the important thing here that none of these are things that the board is going to do alone. We have a superintendent here to help you do it. You're going to be acting almost all the time based on his recommendations. We also a unique factor here too is that the board from time to time acts in, I guess, the legal term that we would use for this is in a quasi-judicial manner. Essentially, we get to hold hearings and hear evidence and issue decisions. And I have a list here of you know a couple of the more frequent items that can come before you in terms of a hearing. So harassment, intimidation, and bullying under state law, the parents or potentially the staff members who are involved in an instance of harassment, intimidation, bullying have the right to ask for a hearing before all of you in which they would come and to convince you to reverse, modify, or potentially affirm the superintendent's recommendation that either something met the definition of harassment and intimidation or bullying or did not. Long-term suspension is another thing. The superintendent and the administrative staff only have the ability to suspend a student up to 10 days. Anything more than that, they would have to come to you and convince you, number one, that the student committed some sort of act that is worthy of a suspension, and two, that there should be a suspension longer than 10 days, the decision that you get to make. Residency appeal. If we believe the student is not entitled to go to school here, the superintendent would come before you to ask to disenroll the student, but the family gets to come and try to convince you to stay your decision based on the hearing. So also uh, in the personnel field, we have a couple of items that will come before you, grievances, under what would be collective negotiation agreements with the, the unions we have in the district, they would come to you, uh, try to obtain relief from what they believe is an unfair decision or a decision that violates their contract. Uh, you also have the ability to terminate employees for cause where they'd be trying to convince you not to terminate them. So we have instrument withholding where we're going to withhold their salary increase for the following year based on something they did. And finally, you would have the opportunity in the context of a non-renewal to potentially overturn the superintendent's recommendation not to rehire the student for the subsequent year. All unique things that you'll get to see on the board of it. How does the board function? Do you function as a collective whole here? We need to have a forum present for the meeting to happen. A forum here is going to be funded members. And you have to meet at least once every two months. I don't think any board of ed has trouble meeting that requirement in the law. Uh, I mean, if you do not have a forum, you can delay uh, starting your meeting. But I think the important thing is you just have to remember your meetings always have to comply with the Open Public Meeting Act. That's generally going to be Jason's job to keep us on track in terms of advertising our meetings and making sure that our meetings here are open to the public. We're only going into executive session for appropriate topics and as we just finished. You have to have public comment every day. And one benefit you have here in terms of the board is you also have the administration to do so much of the work of the school district. You hire your administrative staff to handle the day to day operations here in the school district because, as we'll talk about a little bit further in a few minutes, the Code of Ethics tells us that members of the school board are not here to administer the schools. Your job is to see that the schools are well run. And we see this too in the board's policies that are pretty clear in policy 0146 that no board member should exercise any administrative responsibility with respect to the school district. Or as an individual command the services of any school district employee. And we have to rely on the administrative staff. 
they are the ones who have the proper certificate to do these jobs. So the state has determined who can and cannot do this and has set these roles. Now, our two main concepts for the board are going to be our superintendent and the business administrator. The superintendent obviously administers the entire district and has the responsibility to keep you all informed of everything going on in the district and make recommendations on pretty much everything. And the business administrator is here to oversee all of the business aspects as well as you know maintenance and transportation, preparing the budget, and figuring out everything in terms of purchasing and the financial side of things. And I think just the important thing is you have to rely on the administration. And this relationship, we need it to be as cooperative as we possibly can. If we have an adversarial problem, if we're getting an adversarial with the administrative staff, then we're going to have a problem. And we're not going to be able to run this school district in the way that it needs to run. Now, this does not mean that you have to blindly come to the administration wherever it needs you. You're here to represent the residents of the Reddington Township School District. So you were elected to make decisions on the people's behalf, which may in fact conflict with the recommendations of administration. You're allowed to disagree. But I think it's always important that you listen to the recommendations and try to understand where they're coming from because ultimately these are the professionals that we put in place to guide you. Now, separately, we need to always keep in mind when these issues are handled. And we're always going to be raising our grievances in public. That's never going to be a good look. And it's going to make it appear that you're dysfunctional. And we don't need to. We really don't want that to be going on. So, you know, I think that's clear in the way that we have in policy 9130, which is a reflection of what's in the code of ethics. You know, when we have complaints, you're going to hear complaints from the public. We have to refer them to the superintendent. The superintendent is going to get the first half back. The board is only going to act on complaints like this at a public meeting after the administration has failed to reach a solution to the problem. We don't want to step on the toes of the administration when you have stuff like that going on. And I just, and in terms of the relationship too, the code of ethics tells us that we have to support and protect school personnel and the proper performance of their duties. So whether you like it or not, we have to always support school personnel as long as they are within the scope of the proper performance of their duties. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't have room to disagree with staff or that there's no room to discipline staff. We just cannot be in a position where we're undermining, imposing, or compromising school personnel in the performance of their duties. So, for example, if you like or if you dislike something that, you know, you hear an English teacher is using in class, but it's part of the curriculum, we can't take action that undermines the teacher. We have to take action to, you know, go through the committee process to change the curriculum. And if we just start attacking the teacher for doing their job, that's going to be a code of ethics problem. And in terms of how this responsibility, though, is divided between the superintendent and board, you know, I think it's pretty easy to look at your board policies, but pretty clearly defining the roles on each side. You know, in policy 1210, you know, it's clear that the board's role is to establish policies. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of the uh, code of ethics. While the superintendent's duty is to implement and administer those policies. And he is your advisor, and you're not going to generally be adopting policies without consulting him. But that's always going to be the distinction. That you are creating the policies with his assistance, and then he is the one who goes out and implements. The superintendent is also going to be responsible for you know developing and supervising the entire school program and he has substantial latitude to do this and he takes your policies and will run with them and i think the easiest way to put this is if you assign something to the superintendent that's his job and it's not the board's role at that point to fulfill them i think it's always always it's always important to remember and people um, don't always appreciate that the superintendent while it's not elected member of your board actually does sit on the board of education technically and he has the right to speak on all educational matters during your meetings even though he cannot vote on any issue 
And I think that just looking at the way that the statutes kind of like this one highlight, he has a very important role to play. And you're here in large sense to rely on his expertise in determining the best way to proceed. But more specifically on your roles in terms of being on the board, Individually, none of you actually have any power. The power is in the board itself, the collective whole, the nine of you that come together for your meetings. You're going to be taking action through votes. We've had a couple of votes tonight. Generally, we're going to act on a simple majority. From time to time, there may be something that requires a supermajority or potentially a, uh, in rare case, to a, be a majority of the full board, no matter how many people are present. Board meetings, we're generally going to speak through the board president. You know, individual board members will you know, be permitted to speak if recognized by the board president. And I think it's always important, too, to remember that you all come here with a certain expertise, be it from your professional life, your personal life. Just because you have some area of expertise, it's not going to dictate how the board acts. You know, if you have, for example, a company that's been seen you may be able to assist in terms of the district financial affairs, but you're not in a position to insist on how things are going to run. And just because you have that expertise doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden you can come in and take over in that area. So in terms of, you know, again, we're talking about the individual members of the board do not exercise the full powers of the board, and this is in our policies, but being clear that a board member does not individually possess the authority and powers that reside in the full board. No member of the board has any administrative responsibility. You don't individually have the ability to supervise anybody. It's the collective whole. When you start setting off on your own, that's when problems begin to arise. It's also important to remember that you, rep you represent everybody. You don't just represent yourself. You know, if you have children in the district, you're not here just to represent your own children. You have to think about everybody in the school district. And I think it's also important to remember in times like this that everybody is looking at you very closely. And it's important to do what we can to preserve the board's credibility so we can you know, operate well in public. You know, presenting a united front is often going to be the key to that. I mean, if the public sees that you're divided, the public comment is just going to feed into that. And these meetings could just dissolve uh, into, you know, frankly, chaos. I've seen some public meetings lately. So I'll avoid that from happening. We didn't do too bad tonight, Robert, did we, considering? No, it was great. <laughs> I, I've seen way worse. Yeah. Is that kind of good to hear? Yeah. <laughs> You also have an obligation to preserve confidentiality. And this comes from both our policies and that we'll see a little bit later to so public ethics too. You know, through your service on the board, you're going to be privy to confidential <clears throat> information. Generally, we're going to be getting that through closed session. We could be talking about information on particular students, you can be talking about staff members. You have to preserve that confidentiality. If you start, um, you know. We have a couple of examples here of the sorts of things that uh, you may learn that your one of your child's teachers has been suspended because they need to get a psychiatric evaluation. You can't disclose that to anybody, even if your child is a student in that class and you think, you know, maybe everybody else has a right to know. But that staff member also has an expectation of privacy that we can't know. Now, similarly, you may learn that something is being considered, say we're going to reorganize the school district, you know, we're going to change the grade level of the school. And you have friends who may be looking to buy a house based on the location of the school. You know, we can't share that information until it actually becomes public. And once we're sharing confidential information like this, it will violate the code of ethics. Okay. So, you know, as I, you know, highlighted here in a couple of slides now. If there's any takeaway from this, it's let the superintendent do his job. You know, you have a superintendent. We can skip that stuff, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you have the superintendent for a reason. You know, the law has told us, you know, we need somebody with the 
school administrator endorsements to do a number of tasks. You know, some of them are outlined here in terms of providing educational leadership, uh, recommend action on uh, all staff appointments. The superintendent has the you, you can't actually take personnel action generally without the superintendent's recommendation. That's a, that's in the law, and there's the only real exception to that is a, a non renewal where the staff member can dispute to overturn the superintendent's decision. So, getting to the code of ethics itself, I mean, we've buried the lead a little bit. And the, the main limit here on your power is going to be the code of ethics. It is relatively recent, it only dates back until 2001. And it sets you know, clear standards on what board of ed members must do. Any violation can be raised with the school ethics commission in a complaint filed by, you know, could be literally anybody. The school ethics commission is a commission that's within the Department of Education and it receives and adjudicates complaints regarding both the code of ethics, which I'm talking about now, and there's also another section in the School Ethics Act that deals with conflict of interest and it's a number of prohibited acts. Uh, the School Ethics Commission also administers board member training requirements as well as personal and financial disclosures. And so if you are found to either violate the code of ethics, uh, the prohibited act section of conflict of interest, where you end up deficient on either your disclosures or your training, the School Ethics Commission has the power to recommend penalties against you. And those penalties are reprimand, censure, suspension, and removal. So ultimately, the School Ethics Commission does have the authority to potentially remove you from the board if it is you know, made aware of a violation of really any of those. The, the, the real thing to remember is that if you get a complaint filed against you with the School Ethics Commission, this is real litigation. And it is essentially going to be something that you could defend yourself. I mean, there are people who will defend these cases pro se without having an attorney. But oftentimes, these are something that you're going to have an attorney representing you. And depending on the allegations that are made, will dictate whether or not that is going to be at your cost or not. So if the allegations relate to you know, actions that you have taken in your official role here as a board member, you're generally going to see that you're indemnified by the board. The board will bear your legal rights. But if you are in receipt of a complaint that alleges things that you did that have nothing to do with your service on the board, you might be out of luck and have to finance that on your own. And I in some case right now, that's exactly what happened. The board member who, you know, took action on her own outside of the board and received a complaint with the school ethics commission. She had to hire her own attorney because the board said this doesn't have anything to do with your service on the board. We're not going to pay costs. So there are potential financial hits here in terms of paying for your own defense. So the code of ethics, like I said, is part of the school ethics act. And the school ethics act generally is, you know, it comes from the legislature. And it, it exists because the legislature has decided that boards of education and their members need to be held to a high standard and able to hold the respect and confidence of the people. And you know, the main point here is just to avoid conduct, which is going to create an impression that the public trust has been violated. But in terms of the code of ethics itself, there's 10 sections here. Some of these are going to come up more frequently than others, but a violation of any of them could lead to a potential penalty from the School Ethics Commission. Just running through them briefly, I think it's actually kind of interesting. The very first one, it talks about how, as a board member, you will uphold and enforce all laws, rules, and regulations of the State Board of Education, as well as board orders pertaining to schools. And the state is telling us up front, essentially, that you have to listen to what comes down to track. You know, we don't have the ability to just always be saying no. I mean, if, if there is something that we don't like and we decide not to follow it, we may see a complaint under this section saying that you have not upheld and enforced all of the laws. 
I mean, the second, just following that, tells us that we have to make all of our decisions in terms of the educational welfare of you know, the students here. And that we're going to be developing schools that meet the needs of all students, regardless of their ability, race, creed, sex, or social standing. Now, does this mean you have to make all your decisions based purely on educational welfare alone? And of course not. We have financial limitations that we have to consider. But we can't raise a budget that has an unlimited amount of money. So there's always going to be some financial components here. But we have to always keep at the forefront of our decision making the educational welfare of children. Section C gets into this concept of you know policy making. That is the board's role to create and develop policies. And that the board's role is limited to that because we're confining board action to policy making, planning, and appraisal. The board is not here to carry out those policies, it's here to make them. And when you're framing these policies, you're supposed to do it after consulting those who will be affected by them. And you know, that's going to be dependent on whatever the policy is. We could be talking about staff, we could be talking about students. It's going to be a case by case basis. You know, D is the main limitation on administering the schools that we are going to carry out the responsibility not to administer the schools, but together with the rest of the board to see that they are well run. And in here, I think too, we see the importance of the collective nature of the board, that together with my fellow board members, we will see that they are well run. Nobody's here alone. This is something that is being done by everybody together. And we see that following through in subsection B, where I recognize that authority rests with the board of that. You're saying that I, I understand that I'm not the one with the authority. It's when we get together as a board and reach a decision together, that's where the authority rests. And as a result of that, I'm not going to make any personal promises or take any kind of action that may compromise or harm the board. And on the topic of personal promises that could harm the board, the very next is that we're not going to surrender independent judgment to either partisan political groups or any other group that could be using the school as a personal gain or gain of friends. School board elections are nonpartisan. You know, we're supposed to be checking our politics at the door. That's not always going to be easy for certain things because we have our own political views. But we always have to be using our own independent judgment. We're not going to be making our decisions based on what somebody told us, whether they're a partisan political group or somebody else. And we have to exercise that independent judgment to make decisions in the best interest of the students. So that's forefront of everything. Section G, like I was saying earlier, confidentiality. I will hold confidential all matters that pertain to the school, which if disclosed to equally individual. These injured, injured individuals, that's hard to say, <laughs> or the schools. And then this is always a tough one, too. I will provide accurate information and in concert with my fellow board members, prefer to the the aspirations of the community for the school. We have to write accurate information. That's always something that you see as fertile ground for people filing ethics complaints. That, you know, somebody on social media made a statement that they don't think is quite accurate. But I think also in this section, it kind of contains the, the aspirational role that you're here on behalf of everybody else, that you're going to interpret the needs of the community, the desires of the community, the staff, to get the school district to where everybody wants it to be. Now, subsection H, I will vote to appoint the best qualified personnel after Considering the recommendation of the chief administrative officer here, that's your superintendent. Just one more reminder of the importance of the superintendent to your decision making. Like I've said already, you will support and protect school personnel and proper performance of their duties. That's everybody from the, the superintendent to the principals to the teachers to the secretaries, the bus drivers, and everybody in between. You're here to protect them when they're doing their jobs. Finally, you're going to refer all complaints to the superintendent, and you can only act on complaints at public meetings after administrative solution is found. These are the 10 sections of the Code of Ethics that are 
going to be the most important thing for you to keep in mind as you work this year on the Board of Education. So like we said, going through this quickly, these standards are intended to keep the focus on where it's supposed to be, which is on the educational welfare of the children. We're moving into some politics, both to protect the schools from harm, we're giving our educational professionals that we have hired the ability to run the schools and do their job, and it prevents the Board of Ed from administering the schools, which you clearly can't do. So, like I said, we're really hitting on the limits that this puts on you in terms of administrative powers. I mean, it's clearly limits to the Board's ability to handle the administrative aspect of the schools, because the board's role is supposed to be advisory, advisory and evaluative. You set the parameters for what the administrators are going to do, you set their job description, you set their policies, and then we let them go and do their jobs. We evaluate the superintendent to see if he's meeting you know, the expectations that you've set forth in the policies. This is clear from, you know, now here were the four of the sections in the Code of Ethics. You know, we're confining to policy making, we're not administering the schools, we're seeing that they're well run, we're supporting everybody in the proper performance of their duties, and we're not going to handle complaints on our own. So what sorts of things in the area of administrative numbers could violate the Code of Ethics? So just looking at these four sections that I've highlighted, you know, to violate subsection C, you're going to be looking for action that was taken that was unrelated to your board member's duty to develop general rules and principles that guide management of the schools. Or did you formulate programs or policies to effectuate the goals of the school district? Or did you fail to obtain the value or liability of policy? When subsection D, did you take action that administered the schools? Did you give a direct order to school personnel? Did you become directly involved in activities and functions that are generally the responsibility of school personnel or the day-to-day -day administration of the school district? And in terms of not supporting the staff in Section I, did we take some sort of deliberate action which resulted in the undermining, opposing, compromising, or harming of personnel and the proper performance of their duties? And finally, in terms of Section J and the complaint requirements, you know, did we act on or attempt to resolve a complaint? Or did we conduct some sort of an investigation related to the complaint before it was referred to the superintendent? Or did this occur outside of a public meeting? And these are the sorts of things that, if you are found to have been taken, then will lead to a penalty from the School Ethics Commission. Just it's always useful to look at a couple of decisions or advisory opinions to you know, get a sense of you know, what are these things really, you know, <coughs> a less abstract look at it. And I think that the hiring and personnel decisions are a pretty fertile ground to discuss this. You know, the board member's role in hiring is generally to appoint the best qualified personnel after considering the superintendent's recommendation, like you said. The board cannot withhold its approval on a hiring recommendation some arbitrary and capricious reason, which is really true in any decision. You generally can't be making a decision based on an arbitrary or capricious reason. It would be a, uh, a basis that would open you to being reversed by the Commissioner of Education if the decision was ever appealed. So, generally, the best practice when it comes to this is limiting your involvement in hiring to hiring your superintendent and then considering the superintendent's recommendation to avoid interfering. With his power to recommend candidates to you because the law is clear in 18A 27-4.1 that the board can only appoint, transfer, or remove an employee from his or her position upon the recommendation of the superintendent. So diving into a couple of uh, you know, actual concrete scenarios, uh, in one advisory opinion on the area of personnel matters, we had a board member who requested an opinion from the School Ethics Commission regarding the ability to participate in exit interviews when there was a lot of staff turnover in the school district to try to ascertain the reasons for that turnover. And the School Ethics Commission told the requester in this case that if you did that, you'd be violating the code of ethics. 
that participating in these sorts of exit interviews would be board action that is beyond the normal role of policy making in an appraisal. And not only that, this really is an administrative function, and therefore you'd be stepping into that area of administering the tools which has to be left to school personnel. In another advisory opinion, we had a board member who requested an opinion from the School Ethics Commission about involvement in the interview process for board members. So the commission explained that it's okay for a couple of board members to sit on an interview committee, so long as that committee was established by the superintendent and the board members who are on the committee understand that they are there to function in an advisory role. They cannot conduct the interview. They can only offer their observations and assessments while keeping in mind that the ultimate recommendation is the superintendent's. And the board can never usurp the superintendent's authority to recommend who's going to be hired. But I think that the, the main takeaway for me, at least from this opinion, is that the commission, while saying that this was acceptable, noted that it does not support board members conducting interviews like this for anything below the level of superintendent. Obviously, the board is going to be interviewing the candidates for superintendent. But below that position, the School Ethics Commission said that interviewing is generally an administrative function that is not within the authority of the board or its members. We can think of uh, another school district that was running these kind of interview committees that we represent, and they ran into trouble with this, that uh, the board members kind of took on a role beyond just being there to observe and offer recommendations. And you know, while well, there was never a complaint that was filed against them, had there been, there could have been a real problem there. Stepping away from some advisory opinion, just going to some cases, which are largely examples of what not to do. But there's not many cases out there that rely on to uh, give you examples of what you can do. So in, in this case from 2009, uh, there were some board members who alleged that their board president violated the Code of Ethics through his extensive involvement in the interview process, where he created detailed staffing packets that were used in the hiring process, including rating forms, interview forms, rating sheets, a whole recruiting and interview guide, as well as the selection criteria and listed interview questions. And then he even took the copies of resumes home to review. The superintendent in that case explained that virtually every step of the process was controlled by the board president, and he refused to permit the superintendent to do anything without his approval. As you might expect, the School Ethics Commission found that the board president there violated two sections of the code because his creating of the staffing documents and removal of the resume went well beyond his role in the policy making, planning, and appraisal area. And it frankly, in the commission's mind, did not matter that no one ever objected. Now, the commission also found that his participation in such a you know, discreet level in terms of this process was administering the schools because he became directly involved in what normally is the superintendent's function. In another case of not particularly good facts and frankly even more egregious ones, we had a board member who went to the board office accompanied by another board member without ever giving any notice to the administration beforehand to review candidates for an open position. So the superintendent was not there, the director of HR was also not there, but there was a secretary there, and the board member asked for the resume, gave him some resumes. The board member asked where the remaining were, and they were in a locked office. So the board member went off to find a custodian with the key to the office. And luckily, before that uh, office was open, a super, the assistant superintendent intervened. So those other resumes never actually got reviewed. But that didn't matter to the School Ethics Commission. Because this, again, was action that was taken that went beyond the board member's role to limit their action to policy making, planning, and appraisal. Because she went beyond just appraising the resumes, something that she's allowed to do because she could do policy making, planning, and appraisal, she was taking steps to locate and obtain resumes that were not otherwise available to her. But because of but the fact that she never actually got those other resumes, they found that she did not administer the schools by usurping 
any other job functions or directing somebody to perform an action of harm. In another case, uh, more recently, there was a complaint that a board president issued a rice notice to the business administrator without ever getting superintendent's recommendation. A rice notice is a document that we would hand to a staff member prior to a meeting to inform them that there's going to be executive session discussion of them at an upcoming meeting, which gives them the opportunity to exercise their right to make that discussion happen in public. Um, normally, it's not really an issue giving somebody a rice notice, but it can from time to time, especially if we're talking about like discipline, be viewed by the staff member as something that could be you know, harming their future employment in the district. And that was exactly the case here because the rice notice actually led to the VA's resignation. And the commission held that this action violated the code because it was beyond the scope of the board member's authority to issue this rice notice because it implied that the board was acting to do this when in fact the board had never made that decision, but it was done unilaterally. And as a result of this case, it's now clear that the board president or the majority of the full board can only issue a rice notice to the superintendent. A rice notice to any other employee has to come from the superintendent at his recommendation. Another case with not particularly great facts that dealt with two board members who frankly made a rush to judgment regarding their director of special services who had been accused of double dipping and working in another school district simultaneously with their own. And they conducted their own investigation into this. They then brought their conclusions to the superintendent and demanded that a rice notice be issued, then aired the accusations against the director of special services at the next board meeting in closed session. The board then authorized the board attorney to investigate, and the board attorney concluded that everything was okay, that there was no overlap in the work, and that it had been fully disclosed. So the board president and the superintendent accused these two other board members of going beyond their duties as board members and violating the code. And the school ethics commission agreed with them because they conducted an investigation and made a determination of guilt, sought a suspension, demanded a rights notice. All of this action was well beyond their duties in the field of policy making, planning, and appraisal. They also, in demanding that the superintendent take action, were administering the schools because they improperly directed the superintendent to something. What should they have done here? Board members should have presented the information they had to the superintendent, allowed the superintendent to investigate instead of making demands and depriving the superintendent of the opportunity to reach independent decision. And the board members under the code of ethics must submit complaints to the superintendent and act only if there's a failure of administrative solution. And that's not what they did here. I guess this is the one case I have that we said that everything does not actually violate the code, but I think it is useful in terms of you know, potential guidance. In this case, we had four members on a nine member board like yours who were first uh, participating in an interview process for principal positions. Some other members of the board did not know about this and they complained to the School Ethics Commission that this was usurping the duties of the superintendent. The commission, pursuant to the advisory opinions I talked about earlier, found that there was nothing here that was improper or violating the code through their involvement here. But the commission, like it did in the advisory opinions, expressed its hesitation about having board members involved in this. You know, I think the first concern was that four of nine members is very close to four. And once you hit five members there, that's a public meeting that is subject to the Open Public Meetings Act in terms of notice of the meetings that follow, as well as the opportunity for the public to be there. And the commission again stressed that allowing board members to interview candidates upon whose employment they are ultimately going to vote when the superintendent is recommended could have a chilling effect on the candidates and could prevent a free dialogue during interviews. And there is always the potential to be certain the superintendent's authority to select and recommend who the superintendent feels is the best candidate. Once you have board members there, it's always going to have, even if you don't actually put pressure on the superintendent to do something, it's always going to be some level of implicit pressure there. And that is generally not going to be a good thing. 
Another thing to keep in mind with the code of ethics is Solomon's hearing. Um, he wouldn't necessarily think about it, but Solomon's hearing in the schools can prevent some tricky situations under the code of ethics. Um, in, in one advisor opinion from a few years ago, the board member requested an opinion regarding permission to volunteer in the theatrical productions where the board member was going to assist with casting, rehearsals, and lighting. And the commission said that this would violate the code of ethics if the board member did it because this is not the sort of action that is consistent with your role as a board member. You know, the board member here would be directly engaged in a school-sponsored function that's outside the limited scope of the role. The role would have required the board member to give orders to school personnel, which sounds like administering the schools, as well as engaging in responsibilities that were undoubtedly the domain school personnel. I mean, there also would have been the role there that they would potentially have to be disciplining students, which also kind of uh, transitions into the role for school personnel, and not a board member. And an opinion from the next year, also on the issue of volunteering, there was a request for an advisory opinion on whether a board member could be the leader of a school club, which met on school grounds, with it violate the code. And the commission again said that this potentially would violate the code of ethics because this this board member would have been in a position of oversight and authority over students, and that's not policy making, planning, and appraisal. The role, as the commission found, for the constant presence in the school was going to blur the line between the role of the board member and the volunteer. Because once you're on the board, you can't really turn that off. You know? If you're a board member, no matter what you're doing in the schools, and people are going to recognize that. You're not, you're not there to perform acts like this. But does this mean you can't volunteer ever in the schools? No, you can still volunteer. But you're going to have to be careful in terms of these provisions about administering these schools. You're not going to be able to be volunteering in a position that gives you authority over staff or authority over students. I mean, it's one thing to help, you know, some concessions at a basketball game where you don't really have authority, but if you're going to be in a leadership position and in a position where you're going to be directing people to do things, that sounds like administering the schools. And that could be a potential violation of the code. I know you're waiting for the motion to adjourn. We're almost there. Uh, briefly, we also have to be mindful of conflict of interest. This is not something that's just limited to being on a board of ed. This is going to be being an elected official generally. The School Ethics Act contains a number of provisions that are forbidden. You know, the actual section title is prohibited acts. But you can't be involved in a business or activity that is in substantial conflict with your public duties. You can't use your position to secure unwarranted privileges, advantages, or employment for either yourself, your immediate family, or others. And others is literally anybody. That could be your next door neighbor. It could be a friend from Hungish. You can't be using your position to obtain any sort of unwarranted privilege for anybody. You also can't act in a business capacity where the matter involves an immediate relative or a business organization in which you have an interest. So if you had potentially a HIV issue that involved your kid, you're going to have to abstain from that. You can't accept employment, even if it's unpaid in any capacity that might prejudice your ability to exercise your official duty. You can't accept any gift, favor, loan, or anything of that sort, with the understanding that it was given to influence you in the exercise of your official duty. And you also can't use non-public information for financial gain. I think that's probably easy enough to know. Hopefully you didn't need me to tell you that. <laughs> so in some of these, we do make a distinction between immediate family member and relative. Immediate family member is generally going to be your spouse or any dependent children who reside in your household. Relative, on the other hand, is quite broad and includes almost anybody you're related to. But then, like, say it's fair, they just, we're not quite going out to the level of cousins, but anybody else is going to fall within it, even if it's, you know, your spouse's aunt. That's going to be a, a relative.
relative to the debt. Where do these come up most often? Negotiations with the union. So this is a chart that comes from a select commission advisory opinion that explains, you know, when you can and can't participate. So if you have you have your them. Depends on, you know, if they're a member of the union here or in another district. This will control whether or not you can participate in the negotiations committee, when you can participate to ratify the contract, and also can you participate in you know, the evaluation of the superintendent. And if you have a relative who works in the district, that's going to limit your ability to evaluate the superintendent. You'd have to abstain from that because that can have the potential of looking like you're obtaining unwarranted privileges for your relative. So if you ever if you have anybody in your family who's employed in the district or you have somebody who's employed in another district and you're involved in negotiations, you're going to want to take a look at this to determine whether or not there's a conflict of interest. These used to be a lot stricter in, in the past than they are now. It was used to be pretty hard in the past if you had a, a relative who was employed in an NJDA affiliate in another district and you were going to be The Squelettic Commission now looks at it slightly differently. They now are looking at, you know, are they an officer in the NJEA or the local education association now? Are they on the negotiation team? Or are they in some sort of other leadership role which could influence the actual negotiations? So it's not quite as black and white as it once was. There's going to be a little bit of analysis when we're dealing with who they are in another district. It's going to essentially have to be a case by case determination now, which I guess is probably good for my firm's financial interest, but it makes it much more difficult for everybody else to talk. <laughs> so, to wrap up, some common pitfalls that we want to avoid. Taking unilateral action is always going to be something that's going to potentially get you into trouble. We want to refer complaints to the superintendent and we're not going to take action on them until there's a failure of administrative solution, and only then we're going to act in a public meeting. We can't neglect our stakeholders. When we're framing these policies, we're supposed to be doing after consulting with those who will be affected by them. We need to hear input from everybody. We can't assert authority over staff members. You know, we have administrative staff who has the managerial authority over them. We have to leave that to the administrators. We can't be referring people for employment. You know, that's going to place the staff in an impossible position when it comes time to reckon somebody. And it would also plainly violate the School Ethics Act because we can't use schools for personal gain or for the gain of friends. Superintendent is the one who is going to identify and recommend the best candidate for open position. And if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times tonight, we can't participate directly in the district administration. All these issues have to be sense of the superintendent who will be the one who discusses them with the administrators, makes recommendations to the full board. If you have direct contact with the staff on issues, it could exceed your role of being limited to policy making, planning, and appraisal. So how can we best do that? When in doubt, ask. If you can talk to the superintendent, you can talk to the administrator, and they can talk to us. And we can get things taken care of ahead of time. We also always have the ability to ask for an advisory opinion from the School Ethics Commission. So if there's something that is not clear, we can get an opinion from them and they'll tell us yes or no. Does this violate the act? It's better to know ahead of time. This is not the sort of thing that we want to just wait it and find out what happens. You don't want to Google yourself and have one of the first things to do the School Ethics Commission decision that says that you violated the code of ethics or engage in some sort of conflict. With that, anybody have any questions? I do. <laughs> oh, thank you, Robert. That was actually really good. Uh, hearing it last year and then just like refreshing. But there's something I noticed that I maybe missed another time or just something that I'm not clear on. So in statute C, confine my board action to policy making, planning, and appraisals. It will help to frame policies and plans only after the board has consulted those who will be affected by them. I've never seen that before. What do they mean by 
after only after consulting those who would be affected by them? Well, I think this really comes from, and I think I see two main ways in this time. Number one, you're never going to be doing this on your own. Okay? We're going to be consulting the staff through at least the superintendent, potentially others, all the way through the common domain process. You know, starting in the committee meetings where you know, we may have a number of different staff members who can explain this. And separately from that, I mean, we're going to have this all on the public agenda. You know, the public, whether here tonight in person or remote, has the ability to comment at public meetings. I mean, there's going to be no realistic way that you're going to be able to solicit feedback from everybody. So I mean, I think the main concern there is that you're not just going to unilaterally see on the agenda and approve it. That there is the potential for feedback from the public and you've also gotten the input from school administrators who can explain to you what may happen as a result of this. It just reads that, you know, that the board is consulting with those, which seems like would be a direct violation of this, you know, code of ethics to be, you know, asking for feedback from students like, hey, we're about to put this policy in place. What, how do you feel about it? You know? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no way to get everybody's feedback. So it's just not realistic. But I think that we'll, we're going to want to be able to show is that, you know, number one, we did it in public. Here on the and number two, that you know, we're asking at the superintendent's recommendation. Because generally, these are all going to be on the agenda recommended by the superintendent. If, if I can add, um, when it comes to, like, the mandated policies that come from Strauss, mm -hmm. SMA, those because of either they're mandated and they're referring to laws and regulations and things like that. There's, to me, this sounded more like the policies that you would do, like, for example, when um, we were doing solar, right, where we were developing the policy for our district. And that was a situation where, um, not that I was on the board at the time, but that was a situation where they would um, reach out to the stakeholders to make sure that the policy was making sense. Yeah. To be clear, I don't think that I would say that this applies to every single policy that you adopt because you're going to have policies that frankly have nothing to do with anybody. I mean, Jason may disagree with me a little bit on this, but like, we're going to have a lot of policies on purchasing that, you know, the public is going to have no input on. You're going to get, you know, Jason's opinion, of course, and you know, potentially you know, other parts of the, you know, the administration, but you know, the public isn't going to have the role to play there. And, I think the example that you gave in terms of like solar is a good thing. Or if you were going to put like a turf field in, we're going to want to hear from everybody on that. But it doesn't necessarily have to be every single policy that you approve is going to get to this because, frankly, we're going to be approving policies here that don't really have much of an impact on it. And I think you can think of, and there's dozens of policies you have in your policy manual that are somebody would bat up an eye. Right. No, I know. I say on the policy committee. That's why I was like, I only after the board had consulted those, I was like, really? That's, that's something I had never, I guess, either put together or saw before. So, it's, uh, <laughs> honestly, I, I feel like violations of that generally don't come from the consultation part. You know, violations of that section generally come from you're taking action that exceeds your compensation. But that's not to say that there couldn't be a violation for not, you know, say, uh, getting a public input on something. And it is something that could be directed. Everybody else is ready to go home. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a long meeting tonight. This is longer than anticipated. But I, Thank you for having me. But that doesn't mean that this isn't important. That's, <laughs> it was very good, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Robert. Mrs. Campbell, are there any questions on my superintendent's report from the board tonight? Um, I don't have any questions. I don't. Questions? Maybe from the board. So, so then moving on with the agenda, uh, we had no correspondence that made it onto the agenda anyway. Um, board action, can we get a motion to approve the minutes 1.01? .01? So move Beth. Second, Camille. Yeah. Can I get a roll call? This is better. I'm a left stain. Dr. Sorciello. Yes. This is Fiori. Yes. This is Hample. Yes. 
Mr. Peach. Abstain. Mrs. Bogorski. Yes. Mr. Wallace. Yes. He's on you're, you're you're muted. muted. Uh, he abstained. I read his lips. Does that count? Can you hear me? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> this is full. Abstain. It passes. Uh, moving on to unfinished business. Do we have any unfinished business from the board? Not hearing any. Um, new business from the board. Uh, the committee selections, uh, as as I mentioned, I will email everyone, maybe not tonight at this point, but first thing in the morning um, with the list of committees and then just let me know two or three that you're interested in. Um, and then we'll, you know, we'll appoint everyone to committees. Um, and if you have any questions about the committees, then just email me back. Um, and as you know, we have a vacant board position. Um, so the interview, the appointment process, I'll go over that briefly. So the window for um, applying for the position closes on January 10th. Correct me if I say anything wrong here. Um, so on, at our January 18th meeting, we're going to interview any potential candidates. So the meeting will start at 6 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. It will open in public. We'll go immediately to an executive session and interview the candidates individually. Um, they have like 10 or 15 minute windows, depending on how many people um, apply. And we don't have anyone that applied yet. Okay, so spread the word. And anyone listening online that's interested. Um, so then at 7 p.m., about approximately 7 p.m., we will go back into... We, so after the interviews, we will deliberate and decide on a candidate, and then we'll go into um, public session again and appoint the or name the candidate. Are we doing it that way? But we wouldn't swear them in. We're going to notify them the next day. Okay. So in order to keep uh, the interview candidates from lingering around waiting to see if they're appointed we will uh, let them know the jason will let them know the next day right okay and then we will swear them in at the following meeting on february 8th any questions on how that works the only thing i'll add is that we curated questions. We have a Google folder that we'll share with everyone. We haven't shared that yet, Jason, because we're waiting for some week. You'll have an opportunity, you'll get an email with a shared Google folder from Jason and the board members who have an opportunity to look at the questions. We reviewed them with Carol, with Laura, when she was board president before the break. Um, if you have any suggestions or questions you want to revise, add clarifications, anything like that. Basically, it's each board member takes one question. We ask eight or nine questions, nine, nine or 10 questions actually. Um, we give them about 15 minutes and then that's how we'll do it. Will we know the candidates if, when we have access to the questions? We will, okay. Because if it's like someone potentially returning or we've interviewed previously, we, then we might change questions. Yeah, and, and we found that last time, if we, when we interviewed, when we had three vacancies last year, Carol, when we interviewed like some people two or three times, we found that we shortened the questions sometimes with repeat candidates. But we did find it helpful actually when we shortened them a little too much, we thought maybe we should expand them a little bit more and give them an opportunity to talk more about. But we will know. We will know, right. Like we might want to tailor the questions okay. based off of the candidates that we may know. You'll have access to their resume and their cover letter. Um, was there any other new business from the board? All right, we are now open to the public for anything on or off the agenda. I see one last comment there from Lisa McDonald. Yeah, I'm like, wait, do we, I couldn't remember. I know. I had that. 
Um, I don't even think she's on there anymore, but um, Lisa McDonald said, thank you for including the update. I'm assuming that's the Dr. Hart for the COVID update. Oh, yeah. From way back from a few hours ago. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for comment section. No, I mean, comment on me. Yeah. You got that easy. All right. Uh, motion to adjourn. So move that. Second, Camille. And it is uh, roll call, please. Ms. Benner. Yes. Dr. Sociello. Yes. Mrs. Fiore. Yes. Mrs. Zimble. Yes. Mr. Peach. Yes. Mrs. Bogorski. Yes. Mr. Wallace. Yes. Yes. We're done. And it's 9.29. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, thanks, everybody. For yeah, we can stop. Thank you, Robert. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much.